What's up, everybody? We are back. John Della Rose here, the leading Hispanic voice in science fiction, coming at you with another epic collection review. This time we did Wolverine Inner Fury. Now, this one just came out. I don't know. Well, if this is uh, March 2020 when I recorded this, it just came out at least. Otherwise, uh, ignore that. And it is volume six. So as a lot of people know, the epic collections do not come out in order. They come out with kind of, I want to say random books. Uh, so we've got a volume one, volume two of Wolverine, and we've got volume six, eight, and 13 at this point, I believe. So uh, what this did, I know a lot of people were excited about this because they had other collections of sort of those, that Larry Hama era in the Wolverine mythos to where there's a big stretch of a run uh, on Wolverine at this point uh, because the things got collected here. So uh, this really, if, if you wanna build a collection that doesn't just have this epic collection boulder, border here with this beautiful spine, you can get a ton of Wolverine all uh, in a row here. Got a nice cover, I love this cover of uh, Wolverine fighting Sauron from the Savage Land. We'll get into that in the story in a little bit. So this collects issues 69 through 75, so not that much of the actual Wolverine run, but it's also got three graphic novels here because Marvel is doing a lot of graphic novels at this time, Inner Fury, Killing, and Global Jeopardy. It's got the Sabretooth miniseries and X-Men number 25, which is actually very important to the Wolverine story. It's interesting that the Epic Collections uh, will uh, dip into other series that uh, actually impact the character. And with X-Men, it gets really convoluted because there's so many crossovers and things like that, that uh, it, it's interesting what they choose to collect. But 25 is very important, even though there's a much larger story to that whole Fatal Attractions uh, collection. Uh, X-Men 25 and the Wolverine issue are really all you need to grasp, which is perfect. So it was great, great to read. Good work for the people who did that. All right, so this has a smattering of collections here. And as, as you see, Hama is, is uh, the main name on here. But a lot of the collection doesn't actually feature his work because the graphic novels are pretty big. Wolverine Inner Fury is by D.G. Chichester. And if you've watched my Daredevil reviews, you know I do not like his writing whatsoever. Sorry if you watch this uh, and, and you're him, uh, but or his family or whatnot, or somebody who's a really big fan of his. But I just cannot uh, get into his work. We got Bill Sinkev. Oh, I did. I'm gonna pronounce this. Bill Sinkevich. Sinkevich. Well, I, I give up. All right, but Bill. Uh, <laughs> Bill S. <laughs> has done a lot of Marvel work. Uh, he did a lot on Moon Knight, and I really enjoyed his Moon Knight stuff, but I found I didn't in quite enjoy this one as much, possibly due to the writing, but you know, I mean, some of it just like looks very weird. You get a weird, it almost looks like the Penguin type of character in this one. And basically the plot line, even though it's very convoluted because it's in that Chichester style where he jumps back and forth between characters, kind of makes you figure things out. Doesn't work very great for comics. It's like, yeah, it's like a mix of the penguin and like Darth Vader when he takes his mask off, I guess. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. It's, it's not very aesthetically pleasing. Um, and I just don't feel like this like fit very well as an art style for like Wolverine in particular, as much as I enjoyed it on Moon Knight. Um, so there's a virus or a nanovirus because uh, Chichester likes to do these, uh, these technological stories. Uh, and it's infesting things, Wolverine's investigating. See, see how Sienkiewicz draws Wolverine? I just, it just doesn't do it for me. Um, and eventually it gets into Wolverine. That's why it's called the Inner Fury because he's got this quote, Inner Fury. Again, the art just like, it, it reminds me of like a, like a, a Joker story for, for like a noirish style Batman. Oh well, uh, just doesn't 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 flow well. Sienkiewicz's uh, art doesn't doesn't really lend itself great to a Wolverine, and uh, you know Wolverine gets the virus and then hunts down the people who gave it to him, and the end. So it really doesn't have any great impact on anything. Thankfully, uh, I guess this was a five ninety five book back in the day, pretty pretty hefty price tag, uh, and it looks like it's only forty pages. So. Interesting there also. Then we get into some Wolverine proper. 
And these are pretty fun. Uh, this is uh, Larry Hama's writing, and he's got Larry uh, Dwayne Turner as a penciler, and I think Dwayne Turner, uh, I don't know the name before this, but he does an okay job. He's, you know, got some good backgrounds, got some, got some good expressions on people. Wolverine gets a little awkwardly large at points, uh, but that's okay. Um, and it, it fits the Wolverine style, having him, you know, as a, as a silly beefcake like that. So uh, Wolverine and Jubilee and Rogue are in the Savage Land hunting for somebody to see what's happening. And they get kidnapped and, and hit and uh, they try to be stealthy and it doesn't work out so well. And it's a three-part story, so it's, it's drawn out a little bit. But overall, and it's kind of a trite story, I would say. Sauron, the, the dinosaur, whoa, shows up at this point, and he's trying to be king of the Savage Land uh, here. Let me see if I can get the tripod all set up here. I've got a tripod now. How exciting. Um, and it just continues. You get some you get some fight scenes uh, that, are, that are pretty interesting. And you get a lot of this, like, line work here. Um, it's a little over the top. But it works, and you read through, there's just not much to this story. I mean, you know, there's the Savage Land saga, I guess, but um, it's mostly Jubilee trying to survive and Wolverine fighting things and then Rogue fighting things. And eventually they kind of come to terms, uh, you know, with Sauron and let him do his thing, let him go. Escape. There's a couple other people, you know, there's, there's groups and factions fighting in the Savage Land also. And they get picked up by uh, Bishop and Storm and call it a day. And that's it. So it really, really didn't have a ton of impact. Um, like, kind of a trite story, it, you know, but it, compared to the first graphic novel there, it was supremely readable, which made me happy just because I was able to uh, read a little bit. And then we get to this story with the Sentinels. I don't know if it's the coloring or the inking, but like a lot of this uh, Dwayne Turner uh, spot here. You know, it's a little hard to pick out the figures sometimes. They're, maybe it's over over rendered in the in the inking. It looks like you see all these like ink lines all over his arms. It's like, it's just a little bit much overall. But I, I still don't mind it that much. It's, it tells a story all right. I'm trying to get into a little Todd McFarlane style right here it looks like. Um, and uh, I think this is a nice piece of art right here with Wolverine. But in this uh, one, there's a sentinel who comes to life that they're hunting in Australia now. It's Jubilee and, and uh, Wolverine again. A lot of Jubilee, and I think that comes from the X-Men cartoon. I think they were trying to give her a little prominent role there because of that. Capitalize off that at this point because I think the X-Men cartoon was at full fledge at this point. Uh, it might be the scans, because some of these colors look really faded and some of them don't exactly. I don't, I don't know if it's the scans or if it was just this inconsistent back in the day. Who, know, who knows? Um, but this is really neat when a sentinel comes to life and like kind of like breaks his programming and like gets sentience. And he realizes that uh, the best thing for him to do is kill all the humans, uh, because organic life is actually the problem, not just mutants. Uh, so pretty fun. Uh, very nice uh, x men -y style story. Again, kind of trite because, you know, it, it's all self-contained and kind of goes away at the end of it. But uh, fun stuff. I really enjoyed this arc. Uh, I, I enjoyed the rants of the of the Sentinel uh, through this. I think it's very well paced overall. And yeah, it might be the scans. Like, so I don't know if I can show this very well through here. But it's like grainy in here. You see how it's grainy when I get up close? Uh, so it might be the scans on this, or I don't know if it's, it's the way that the colors were done at this point, but a little bothersome. Um, still fine to read. Uh, and so you go through, and it is another three-part story just like the last one, and eventually they fight a bunch of Sentinels, and boom! Uh, and what's interesting is there's like a end where Jubilee s stops the killing of one of the Sentinels, and so the main Sentinel who came to life is like, oh! Wait a minute, what is this human empathy thing? I must focus on this. And he decides that you know he needs to study this and it's gonna take him 2,700 years to do so. And so he shuts himself down and it just kind of deus ex machina ends things for them. 
in the middle of this here. Now, Jubilee's got a nice character arc in this one, which is what makes this more interesting than the Savage Land story. She uh, has these flash parts uh, with Sentinel earlier in this series where she, her parents were killed and she finds her parents' killers and she's gonna get revenge on them. So they actually like go and, and show that at the end. And then she sees kind of how unsatisfying it is to just kind of beat up on humans who don't have her power and uh, and just kicks them in the nuts rather than kills them. Uh, very Jubilee. I, love, I don't know, good characterization all around, very fun. And that's that. Then we get into another weird graphic novel uh, by John, Nay Reaver? I don't even know who that is. An artist, Kent Williams, called Killing. And this also has like weird art to it that I just do not like. Uh, it's all, as you see, the colors are all muted. It makes it very hard to read. And a lot of dialogue here. This guy, I don't know how many comics he's written. I don't know who he is, but he really overdid the internal monologue. Uh, to where it's it's a, it's a little bit obnoxious. We get a little Jubilee just show there's a little bit of continuity, but other than that, it's a pretty self-contained story again, where Wolverine just goes off and hunts some stuff down. Gosh, I, uh, I almost forgot that, I, I'm getting close to forgetting this story because it's a pretty forgettable story. Wolverine, okay, so now I remember. All right, <laughs> pretty forgettable story. It's tough because the art's so bland and, and really doesn't have a great comic style to it. Nothing really sticks out as exciting here. But basically this girl is trying to leave her Tibetan home. Wolverine shows up there, uh, he rescues her. They want Wolverine in there for some reason, uh, uh, the people who are the powers that be here. And they're trying to get him uh, to impregnate her to have like little Wolverine babies. Uh, with healing powers and stuff like that. And uh, she's a runaway and, and ends up being a cast out. Wolverine ends up uh, you know, saving the day, basically. Just another kind of trite story. And actually the storyline's all right. It's just the art makes it really hard to follow. And the internal monologue just slows the pace down so much in those areas where it happens. Once, it's, once she gets out of that, it gets much better. Uh, but it's an eminently forgettable story at the end of the day. And again, you get this character who like, doesn't matter and goes away. So that's it. And then we get to the Sabertooth miniseries. Now this is interesting for me. Uh, I was 10 when this came out and my mom wouldn't let me get it because it looked too violent. And uh, I always wanted this and uh, it was a miniseries I always wanted to read. I thought it was so cool. I loved Sabertooth and the Marvel Masterworks uh, card set and uh, and, and the art on this was just like, wow, he's a scary monster. This is awesome um, for the covers, right? Um, and so I always wanted to read it and I never got to. And finally I got to. This is Larry Hama again. We get the same dark, uh, oversaturated colors, which, you know, kind of kind of bogged down these stories a little bit. But this is a Mark Teixeira's art, so it's a little better overall. And it uh, deals with Sabretooth, uh, dealing with some assassins. Yeah, look at the muscles. <laughs> Very 90s. And uh, he's got a sort of mistress, and he beats up on her. She is a psychic, though, so she gets in his head. Very weird stuff. Uh, very interesting, though, at the same time, and really gives a huge amount of background to the, the character in the story. Look at this, this uh, the big thick lines on the outside, and, then, and all, that, all the little detail lines of the extra muscles on muscles. Very 90s. <laughs> Um, uh, the inker or, or whatever, the way he did the hair on the body, it's really interesting. Look at, look at the little squiggly lines. Yeah, but squiggly lines are kind of everywhere. Um, and, and it's distracting a little bit, but it's all right. Um, it still flows okay. But Sabretooth has an assassin after him and they want him to kill Mystique. And we get into a little background origin stuff of, look at the covers though, the covers are, this is why I wanted the book so bad, that these covers were so amazing. Um, and Sabretooth's like, whatever, I'll go kill her. They, they plant a bomb inside Sabretooth and to force him to do the job and he has to kill her before things go up. And there's also kind of a mystery of what's going on. And we learn about his past and how he was abused uh, and how he came to be Sabretooth, which is actually a pretty interesting miniseries. Um, and we get a little cameo by Wolverine, I guess it's more than a cameo. He's in issues two and three, and so how this gets in the Wolverine deal. And um, 
shows up and has a little battle before he kind of just talks because of what Mystique says and then jets off. So Mystique talks about how she actually was some person from um, Sabretooth's past who he was in love with or whatnot. And uh, Sabretooth eventually decides just to go and kill the dude who is, is planning this whole scheme in the Society of Investment Bankers with a chomping on a cigar. Oh, what an evil villain. Larry Helm is very straightforward, and I like that about his storytelling, as, as you definitely know this guy's a villain, right? <laughs> um, and just these covers. Man, I could. I, these covers are so great. So uh, fourth issue is, is Wolverine basically, or Sabretooth going in, uh, kicking butt, taking names, being evil. You know, peak 90s. But I enjoyed this. I thought this was a very fun read. And uh, he then uh, discovers that he had a son with uh, Mystique. And that's kind of an interesting plot point. And uh, he uh, kind of lets his son live throughout all this, even though the son was the villain who's trying to do this. So very interesting. Shows that Sabretooth isn't all cold-blooded killer, I guess, even though he, he really is. Um, he let his son live, so there you go. What a, what a, what a hero, I guess. And for more Sabretooth, check out X-Men Unlimited number three at the bottom here, which I would like to, um, but it's unfortunately not collected in these volumes. All right, so we continue on, and that was the Sabretooth miniseries. Uh, you notice all the, the background borders are black in that miniseries. They really wanted to make this dark and badass 90s all, all the way around. So you get this like whole swath of the book with, with the, the black there, and you can, you can see it, and that's the miniseries. And then we get a really weird one off, uh, Global Jeopardy, which is uh, a wildlife awareness sort of thing, and it's written by Peter David, which is interesting, and... It's Wolverine and Kazar and Submariner, and every page has a like advertisement, like about some, or I guess a, I, will, I guess it's not an advertisement, like a fun fact about like some endangered species. So you, you can give this to your kids and let them learn about orangutans and things like that. And it starts out with all these characters coming together because they want to preserve wildlife. And there's hunting wildlife, and they fight because they're heroes, and heroes fight very classic style Marvel art, which I like. Um, this I, I think the house Marvel style that looks like this is really the aesthetic of comics that I really want out of things. So pretty interesting. And, you know, it's, it's just a trite little story where they like, you know, have a good moral um, about preserving wildlife and doing the right thing. Definitely, a, definitely a, a kid's book. And here's the little end pinup where they've got, oh, look at the tiger and the little tiger babies, right? So another trite thing that really didn't have too much. But what I was interested in of this is uh, the dedication here, Carol Kalish, 1955 to 1991. And they said uh, she did great things for the comic industry. I have not looked her up yet, uh, but I'm going to after this video, find out who she is, because they really wrote a nice dedication to her. And I, I wonder what her contributions were. So. That's that, another one-off. Like these one-off graphic novels, uh, well, while this one is all right, I mean, Peter David's never terrible. Um, you know, I mean, it just was pretty trite and silly, and the other two really didn't ring very well as stories. So it made, made this volume a little tough to get through. Um, and then uh, issue 25, so we get Fatal Attraction. So this is a big X-Men crossover, and all the X-Men have this like hologram cover uh, at this point. Um, and there's a big Fatal Attraction storyline, but they only cover X-Men 25 and uh, the Wolverine issue out of this because that's what has to do with Wolverine. Um, there is a hardcover volume of, of Fatal Attractions out there for folk who want to read the whole thing. Um, and basically Magneto is trying to create his Magneto land. Beautiful art on this one. Who did this? Who did this art? Does he even say anything? here? There it is. Uh, oh, Andy Kubert, yeah. Duh. Oh gosh, and they had Matt Ryan as anchor. Matt Ryan's one of the best too. So you, you got uh, like the dream team artists here for X Men Twenty Five. Andy Kubert with Matt Ryan inking, just like just perfection in comics. Um, so very nice to read. Look at all these these cool space stations and backgrounds and stuff. Magneto looks so menacing. Oh my gosh, it's pure action. And the crowd—they have to draw crowd scenes. Poor guys. All right, Magneto's flying around. 
and they want to take them down. So they're going to make this like whole web around the earth that like basically nullifies a Magneto's powers. And they have to highlight all the X-Men and stuff in here. So for the crossover, so you can see everybody. Xavier's kind of weird with this, with his beard. But uh, again, everything's just like super dynamic looking and super awesome looking with these guys. And Magneto knows about this. So he's uh, ready to, you know, kill everybody because of that. And the X-Men are gonna take him down. Yeah, so they get on the space station in their spacesuits. Get the big fight scene going. Pretty shortly, lots of build up to the fight scene. Very, very, uh, very tense moments in here. And I like that, that the coloring is just pretty standard comic coloring, so it's, it makes it easier to read than those, those other wonky ones where they were experimenting a little better. Um, look at that, look at the angle on, on Magneto. He's like looming over you, beautiful. Um, Another, another weird perspective shot with Wolverine here. Very cool though. It all, it all works because Andy Cooper's just amazing. Um, and we have a fight with Magneto as he's gonna you know kill all the humans because you know they won't let him have his mutant utopia. And there's, there's Gambit because they gotta feature Gambit too because Gambit's popular at this time. Um, and we have a huge fight. Uh, X-Men Xavier and Jean Grey are trying to break into Magneto's mind and screw him up and, uh, and then uh, there's some moral dilemmas regarding that. And here's the big deal. Wolverine gets his adamantium ripped out. I heard about this as a kid and never never read it before. And it sounded so gruesome, and it is so gruesome. And they build up this whole, like, uh, tragedy is going to happen to Logan and change his world forever. And it really does. Uh, so this is a very cool moment uh, in X-Men and Wolverine uh, storytelling here, which was just absolutely great. And that ends there. Um, and Magneto is all screwed up because from Xavier's, you know, head tinkering and Wolverine's all screwed up from physically. So it's like a juxtaposition of mind and body. And then we have this wonderful cover for Wolverine 75 where his own body is fighting against him. And Larry Hama writes this one. Who drew it? Uh, Adam, Adam Cooper. Yeah, there you go. So you just get top tier talent on these, on this crossover all the way around. Um, and look at that, look at that spread. Oh my gosh. Uh, just beautiful, beautiful artwork. Look at, look at this, just like, just the creativity here is just off the charts. But this whole issue is a reaction to the last issue where Wolverine's basically fighting to survive. He's got a fever and, and they're gonna, they're actually leaving that space station where they're fighting Magneto and making a crash landing. So everything's super action-packed and dynamic. And even though it's really drawn out, like, I mean, Hama milks this. Uh, they milk, I mean, they're still crashing this spaceship, but we're 10 pages in, 20 pages in, and this is a 40 page, uh, page there. Wolverine's still out of it, uh, and it's still going on. He really milks it with the beautiful art, and it does, you know, look at that, just beautiful. Wolverine sees visions in his head of the light. Uh, is he gonna survive? We don't know. I mean, how many pages are we into this now? 30? Jeez. Um, not much happening for real, but the emotional stakes are so high and the tension is so high. It all works as Jean Grey about to fall out of a spaceship. Gosh. Um, Jean! Yeah. Um, you, can almost, you can almost see a movie of this. And then uh, as, as he's hearing Jean scream, that's what brings Wolverine back to reality. And even though he's, he's fevered and hooked up to machines, he saves Jean's life. There you go. Very cool. And that's it, that's a big reaction. And then there's like a 10 page denouement where Wolverine now is, it's a couple days later, he's trying to like figure out his life without adamantium. He's fighting in the danger room and he gets his butt whooped and he's like, oh gosh, things aren't gonna be the same. I'm a problem. Then he busts out his claws and he has bone claws now and he's losing blood and everybody's worried about it. Very tense moment again, just like huge character stakes that are very emotional there. Just worked very well. This Fatal Attractions is just amazing. And it just cuts to him talking with Jubilee. Um, and we learn that his, he's got these, he's trying to just like keep those going, even though there's pain involved in his bone claws. He's trying to keep it going like a uh, like a, a ear piercing. He, he likens it. Look at this beautiful image right here. Um, and talking with Jubilee, who's kind of taken under his wing, and then eventually it ends with a three-page letter to Jubilee where we see like this like very emotional, sad moment of him leaving on his motorcycle to kind of find himself and uh, kind of abandoning Jubilee, unfortunately. And that's it, and that's where it ends. So these this last two issues with Fatal Attractions was beautiful. 
uh, absolutely phenomenal stuff. Um, get a nice interview about that where they were, uh, they talk about the stakes and it's gonna ruin, change Wolverine forever, or, you know, which is pretty fun. And that was great. Um, so I enjoyed the Fatal Attractions crossover a lot, which is good because that's 80 pages of this whole deal. Um, I think that the Wolverine 69 through 75, they were fine. Maybe they're just standard comic fare. They felt like filler almost, uh, but they were, they were all right. Uh, through 74, I should say. The graphic novels all fell flat in their own ways. Interfury was just a train wreck, Trichester nightmare. Killing was just kind of forgettable with very bland colors and art, which made it difficult to read even though it had an okay storyline overall. And Global Jeopardy just like was a, uh, a kind of, you know, charity book that was a little too shoehorned for what it was doing. Sabretooth uh, was a pretty solid miniseries by Larry Hama and I enjoyed that. And so this is like the ultimate mixed bag. Um, I'd say overall, there was a lot less readable content than there was readable content for this one. Uh, but the readable content was so good, it really made up for it. So. Yeah, it's tough, uh, but I'm going to give this a little below average grade of a six for an epic collection. And, um, you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm glad I kind of got into some Wolverine history, but uh, not, not the best outing here. All right, guys, uh, hit that like and subscribe button. This was a long uh, one. I really talked a lot about this book, uh, but uh, I hope you enjoyed it too. I guess I will talk to you later.